Hi, and welcome to Solutions Pod, where we invite you to join us in a journey of stubborn optimism, tackling significant challenges facing our communities, our health, and the environment. My name is Anastasia Vazovic. I'm a community manager at Nature Hub, a platform supporting conscious consumers, green businesses, and sustainable enthusiasts. Um, and it's also our sponsor of the video today. We're happy to welcome our wonderful guest, Sergio Agen from EnergyX. Thank you for joining us today. And yeah, first and foremost, please tell us about Energy X and what wonderful energy solutions for a sustainable future you develop. Yeah, thanks for having me, Anastasia. It's a pleasure to be here and chat with you for the next hour or so. Um, so at Energy X, we're focused on the, the energy transition, as you mentioned. Uh, where uh, in the supply chain we're focused is, is rather far upstream. So we look at uh, the raw materials that go into the batteries uh, for energy storage, and we uh, are solving better ways to produce those raw materials, specifically lithium. Um, as you probably know, and as many of the viewers probably know, uh, lithium is one of, if not the most important material in the battery. And uh, the demand for batteries is out of the roof right now. And therefore, that leads to a huge demand for lithium. Uh, and there's a big supply demand gap right now between what the battery manufacturers and EV companies are demanding and how much is actually being supplied. So the problem that we're addressing is how do we improve our methods of manufacturing of this critical material? Uh, how do we make that more efficient and sustainable as well as more, more cost effective? Mm -hmm. And also you pride yourself on creativity as well. So what um, age old infrastructures you're planning on replacing with new research and novel technologies and systems? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, and, and the answer to that is a little bit tricky. Um, and I say that because when we first set out on this mission, uh, the current infrastructure that is used for producing lithium are these huge evaporation ponds uh, where they pump up the lithium um, brine or water, basically, and put them in the evaporation ponds. And then uh, the sun evaporates the water out and the lithium salts precipitate. And then you can use that uh, for battery materials. That's a very simplified version. But this natural evaporation technology has essentially been around since like the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. I mean, it is, it is the most basic concept of uh, extraction and salt using natural evaporation. So when we, uh, when we started looking at this, we said, this is just prime for disruption. We can replace these ponds. This is old technology, very inefficient, um, really takes a really long time, very low recovery rates. And ultimately those, those factors lead to higher cost. What we didn't realize is that these companies, uh, these large mining companies and chemical companies that are producing these materials um, are pretty reluctant to change. I mean, mining in general is a capital intensive business and they've already sunk hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars into this infrastructure. And uh, it, it, it is, it works to some extent, right? Like they're producing some lithium and they're adverse to change. So originally our, uh, our approach was use this new technology and get rid of the ponds. And we were met with extreme reluctance to that because one, as I mentioned, they've spent a lot of money on, on their existing infrastructure. And two, all sorts of this mechanical separation or, uh, what's called direct lithium extraction, and that's basically what EnergyX works on, is relatively unproven technology. Like, yes, we've proven it in the lab and, and started to do pilots, but on a commercial scale, it's unproven. So to uh, invest, you know, lots of capital into this new method of manufacturing is risky. And for that reason, you know, the going back to the main question, what type of infrastructure do you replace? 
our approach is now to actually have a complementary system to the existing infrastructure as a bridge, right? If the ponds that they use currently are only 30% uh, effective, let's first make them 100% effective by recovering all the available lithium with this small add-on piece. And then we can move towards a path that replaces the ponds in the future. But there needs to be some sort of like, like for instance, in oil and gas, it's not like, like we all know lithium and batteries and electric vehicles are better, but it's not just like one day uh, these big car companies like Ford and GM can just stop making gas and move to electric, right? I just, that would never work. There's already so much infrastructure that's built around that. So there needs to be this kind of like slow transition and we're facing that, that same type of uh, predicament as well. Well, yeah, that's a very tough task you've put yourself in front. So um, yeah, good luck with that. And I really hope it's working. So I would, I'm just really wondering whether since you've changed the approach, um, has there been more success? How are you feeling the market is going now? How are you feeling with the, you know, with the business um, connections at the moment? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was a critical pivot that we made in our business. And since then, we've had uh, tremendous success in terms of uh, customer reception to, to our approach, right? So now when we explain, you know, lower, lower capital costs, they still get to utilize all of their infrastructure and we hit uh, target recovery rates of 90%. There's been a much more willingness to test our technology and move into piloting. So it's been, it's been a much better reception from the customers. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I believe our community would love to hear more about the sustainable side of the business. So as you go forward, what atmospheric impact on biodiversity, the toxic uh, emissions and material waste are you planning to minimize? So I think this is obviously an important topic and discussion, um, just sustainability in general. But the way that I think about sustainability is a little bit different than most. Um, I bucket sustainability into two into two silos. Uh, one is your carbon footprint from extracting resources from the, from the earth. And the second is uh, utilization once those resources are uh, in the application, right? So this question about sustainability, you have to benchmark it, like what are we benchmarking it against, right? Um, for lithium, for what we're doing, you know, I, I think it makes sense to benchmark it against fossil fuels, which are, you know, and that's, that's in terms of uh, mobility, right? Like I'm thinking about batteries in cars versus gasoline in cars. That's, that's my main comparison. And uh, in terms of the application bucket and utilization of lithium in uh, cars, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing to be even compared. Like it, I've, I've run the numbers and one ton of lithium that's utilized in electric vehicles. You can, you can build about uh, 20 electric vehicles with one ton of lithium. Um, there's about a hundred pounds of lithium in a battery, in a car battery that displaces 145,000 tons of CO2 per year, one ton of lithium. And then on top of that, <clears throat> if you charge your car using renewable sources, that's an additional 35 to 40,000 tons uh, displaced of CO2. If you charge your car from traditional fossil fuels like gas or whatever, however your electricity is coming, then you don't get that additional uh, reduction in CO2, but still 140,000 tons per one ton of lithium utilized, that is the true sustainability metric that I look at. And that's why I split it into these two buckets. When you look at the other bucket, uh, extracting resources from, from the earth, I mean, there's a carbon footprint no matter what, right? Uh, whether you're extracting fossil fuels like oil and gas, or you're extracting battery materials like lithium, nickel, 
cobalt, copper, or you're extracting wood that is your laptop is probably sitting on some sort of table, I assume. Uh, the house that you're you're living in, like everything is extracted from the earth and there's a carbon footprint no matter what. And so, so then you have to dive deeper into that side of the equation in terms of the sustainability discussion. And, um, you know, you can, there, there are obviously improvements that can be made uh, in terms of the current methods of extraction and things that we look at are like water usage, how much water we're using, uh, electricity, how much electricity we're using, footprint, but there's pros and cons of both, both of these things, right? So the pond systems that I explained to you earlier, right? They're huge, massive footprints. Like they can be 10 square miles in size, which is bigger than New York City, uh, all of Manhattan. Um, and they're, they use a lot of water uh, that gets evaporated and wasted out of the, the waterbed system, but they use zero electricity. They use the sun, right? So for us, we're implementing uh, a mechanical system that, of course, has higher recovery rates and shorter time and from an economic perspective is much more attractive. Uh, from a footprint perspective is much more attractive. From a water standpoint, we use zero fresh water, but we use electricity to, to force the, these separations. So we have higher electricity footprint than say natural evaporation. So I think there's trade-offs um, in a lot of this, uh, and that just needs to be considered. Um, you know, all of those things need to be considered when you're talking about sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And when you try and chase the perfection, it's almost never works out. And yeah. it's a very honest answer. And thank you for that. Yeah, there's you know a lot of greenwashing where companies trying to portray that they are much better than they are, but in the end of the day, you know, yeah, as you said, there is, so you're taking it from somewhere in some way anyway. Um, yeah. And yeah, but I've, I was really quite um, pleasantly surprised from a lot of information you have on your website for, um, you know, different ways um, of, of, of making life more sustainable. So how can individuals play that part towards a better future? You share some really interesting advice on your website. Um, would you like to go over, go over maybe a few points now? So I think that number one is education, right? Uh, like just the fact that there's still doubters out there about climate change and global warming, like that, that's the first thing, right? Like uh, general acceptance of this, of this movement. And I, th I think, you know, that the writing is on the wall and that, you know, we're, we're on a path to, like that can't be turned back in terms of the transition, like the transition is happening. It's really about big companies uh, making it easier for the average consumer to participate in the transition. Um, but, but they need to be educated, willing to take that step that may or may not be, econ like it, at, at the end of the day, a lot of it is driven by economics, right? Uh, you know, I could give the easy answer, like turn off your lights when you go out or, you know, like mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's uh, kind of fluff, right? Um, just, just having an attitude and awareness of global, like not everybody's going to go out and start a company like energy X, right? Like, we, you know, we do, we do, we're like, we're actively trying to help this supply chain, uh, and push forward for a, mo a more renewable future. But in terms of like everyday life, um, just, I would say, just be aware of the things that are contributing towards, towards global warming, uh, and climate change. And, and be an advocate for that. Like anybody can be an advocate and the more advocates that there are and the more, the more discussion that's happening around it, the, the, better, the better that it is, right? Like you don't have to go to the extreme maybe like, like Greta Thunberg <laughs> or something like that. But like she, you know, she doesn't have a company that's working on the problem, but she's obviously a huge vocalist. Uh, you know, she probably takes it to the extreme where she like won't get on a, you know, she'll take a sailboat across the Atlantic instead of uh, like a fossil fuel powered boat. Like I'm not recommending that to <laughs> the general public or anything, 
but you, you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's um, a question of taking responsibility, as you mentioned, you know, there are businesses right. who need to take that responsibility to offer that to um, the consumers, but then also there needs to be demand and it needs to be economically viable for companies to actually implement that. So there is responsibility from each side and if everyone plays their part in some way. And as I said, Greta has her part, you know, with raising that awareness and probably even making it somehow fashionable for younger generation so everyone's got their yeah everyone's got their role yeah you mentioned that obviously you have um other ideas about how um, you can make processes within the business more sustainable uh but what else can people you know be interested in your work be looking out for in the future so what you know some of your future ideas future plans we we made a master plan in 2019 and laid out kind of some of the steps that we wanted to take over the next 10 years uh to create products um, and services uh, and technology that would push the energy transition forward. Uh, the first products that we're focusing on, like I mentioned, are these direct lithium extraction technologies, which is pretty far upstream. You know, we're looking at the actual production of the raw materials that go into storage. And storage is uh, one component of a renewable energy future. The, the other is the generation. So those two things create a circular economy where um, you, you have it, you, you generate it, but then you need to store it, right? So that's the first thing. Um, we're also looking at a little bit further down the supply chain. So it's a long supply chain from raw material in the ground into batteries in, in electric vehicles, right? We're also looking at uh, the batteries themselves, like how to make longer lasting batteries. And that ultimately plays into the economics uh, of the situation. Um, and, then, and then a lot of the processing that, that goes in between that, like how do you, you know, how do you actually turn raw materials into batteries? Uh, that's, it's not an easy process. There's a lot of electrochemical uh, processing that, that happens along that supply chain. So, we're looking at all of those things. Um, you know, now there are a lot of big companies that are also uh, on that trail. Um, obviously, Tesla leading the pack, but big battery manufacturers like LG, Samsung, Panasonic, uh, all the all the big car companies that are following in Tesla's footprints, the lithium companies that are producing the raw materials, and then processing companies that make do the manufacturing to help the processing um so it's an exciting journey and you know we we kind of have a little different model where companies like high growth uh technology companies like ours typically have uh they they typically only accept like venture capital funding or like things like that we've opened up our opportunity our investment opportunities to the general public uh through um, regulated offerings twice now, and we're, we're planning a third one that's coming up, but anybody can come in and, and invest uh, as little as $500 into our company, which I think is kind of cool. And to think about like, if you would have done that on the early days of Tesla, like what that return would be, <laughs> it's pretty exciting. Um, I think that's a common thought, isn't it? A lot of people would be saying that. Yeah. Um, so we yes. have, I mean, we have, we have, we have over 3,500 investors in our company now. Um, and, you know, anybody can participate in that fashion, but we're also high, we're, we're rapidly scaling and hiring the business uh, at the business. And today we have 30 employees and we're scaling that up to a hundred employees. And, and, you know, if people are scientists or engineers or chemists that work in, um, battery technologies or somewhere along that supply chain uh you know we have a lot of open job positions so that's another way that people can get involved that's awesome so people who do want to potentially join your business or people who want to invest or you know just find out more about um energy x how can people find you online how can people get in touch really simple just energyx.com <laughs> so everything and, through uh, mm -hmm. yeah when you go to our website um it's uh, like you said, it's a pretty comprehensive website. There's a lot of different links and there's a careers page. There's an invest page. Uh, you can learn about the company and the background and how it started. You can learn about the technology. 
Uh, you can learn about some of our sustainability initiatives and, and our innovation and you know where we work and patent portfolio that we're that we're building. Uh, there's a media page where you can see like the blog posts and the videos and some uh, like industry wide uh, resources and you know our places we've been featured in the news. So see all that stuff all on energyx.com that's awesome yeah um, and you also mentioned that obviously there are um a lot more businesses that are not starting to join the same or share the journey with you um with energyx so do you feel like these big companies um joining this movement um they're making it easier for you in some way because they're making it more mainstream or do you feel that that competition is actually making it harder much easier much much easier i mean it's all about the whole transition in general is all about how much capital is flowing into the business. And I like to compare it to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, a hundred. So, so today the average human lifespan is 79 years old. A hundred years ago, the average human lifespan was 49 years old. So it's increased 30 years over the past hundred years. And a large, uh, a large reason for that is because of the um, capital investment into R&D for new medications or therapies or treatments to address disease that, that humans have, right? Or figure out how to do knee replacements or you know what, whatever it is, right? And the R and D budget for pharmaceuticals uh, over not a hundred years, but in the past like three decades or so, thirty years, has been fifteen percent of the total uh, budget uh, revenue for pharmaceutical companies. Now compare that to batteries and renewable energy. The total, specifically batteries, I don't know about if that applies to uh, generation like solar and, and wind and things like that, but for battery R&D, that number is 1%. So you can see, but, but now, it, now it's starting to become a lot more, right? So you can see like with, with new investment coming from major corporations, uh, like Tesla wasn't a major corporation 10 years ago. Their, their market cap was $3 billion in 2012. Now it's $650 billion. So they're a huge company now and they can invest billions of dollars. But other, other big companies are starting to invest more and more and more because it's, a, it's like a snowball effect, right? And that's why I said earlier that like the transition is unstoppable at this point. Like the snowball is happening. The investment is coming in. All these car companies are transitioning to electric um, and many other facets of the energy transition are happening as well. So to your question, it's a super exciting time because so much capital is flowing into this. And that obviously trickles down to what we're building, right? Sounds amazing. And yeah, very exciting journey that, that you're going through at the moment. Um, anything else you'd like to add? You think maybe our listeners um, should definitely know about? Like I said, uh, our website is super informational. And if, if any of the listeners have specific questions, um, you can email me and I, I answer all the emails. It's just hello at Energy X. And I actually do answer that email. So um, <laughs> if, if I didn't hit something that uh, a listener was thinking about or had a question for, just feel free to get in touch with us and uh, do my best to, to give you a thorough response. Yes, for sure. And yeah, feel free to leave the comments down below or uh, email Taggy directly, as he mentioned. And yeah, if there are a lot of questions about something specific, then we'll be sure to do another interview as well, discussing that specific topic, because at the moment it's just generic um, conversation about everything and anything within Energy X. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It was lovely having you and it was an amazing conversation. I'm sure there is a lot to learn from this. Um, and I hope we, we get to talk to you again soon as well. Sounds good. Thanks, Anastasia. Thank you, guys.